Great. Okay, thanks. So welcome, everyone. My name is Sally Snyder, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm the coordinator of the Rogue Community College Diversity Programming Board. And my co-hosts today are Jenny Jackson, Reverend Ernestine Flemister, Rem Reverend Ryan Scott, and Reverend Tom Berry. So our mission I would like to go over first for our Rogue Community College Diversity Programming Board is to enrich, support, and celebrate our diverse community by acting as a catalyst for inclusion, continuous learning, understanding, and acceptance through active engagement and facilitation of educational opportunities that challenge biases and deepen conversations. So of course we have our usual notes on etiquette. Please mute your microphone unless you are speaking. Please keep a stationary position or turn your camera off. No eating on camera. And to join the conversation, utilize your chat, utilize the chat or raise your hand. And so our conversation ground rules, which we have adapted from the Conversation Cafe, helps us to create a safe space to learn, share, and grow. Uh, keep an open mind, listen to all points of view, and be curious. Acceptance, suspend judgment as best you can. Respect, seek to understand rather than to persuade or convert. Discovery, question old assumptions, look for new insights. Brevity, go for honesty and depth, but don't go on and on and on. And sincerity, speak only for yourself about what has personal meaning. No. So here are some great resources to learn about Oregon's history. And Jenny, will you post this in the chat, please? We've got a link for you. And you can click on the links and see the exhibits and the documentaries and the articles. So I grew up in Oregon, uh, Portland for about 30 years, and then here in Southern Oregon for the last 20. And I learned to be very kind and accepting of people. Um, but I didn't, I didn't learn, what I didn't learn growing up is a full history. I didn't know anything about black history. And it really wasn't that long ago that I was in the camp of what do you mean racism exists? Um, slavery, slavery was abolished a long time ago. What do you mean there's still a problem? So if you don't understand why slavery still has an impact, why racism, how racism still exists, it just means you have some learning and digging to do, and we're glad you're here with us. Um, quick announcement. Uh, we have a group of individuals who are helping connect people to more options for learning and action, particularly here in Josephine County. So if you're interested in being more involved, there is a survey in the chat box. Jenny, if you could pop that survey in the chat box. And next, I would like to introduce Lois, Lois McMillan. She's an authority on US history and a teacher at Grants Pass High School. In addition to the numerous awards and honors that are listed here, she, has also, she is also the Oregon History Teacher of the Year, and she has been nominated as the National Teacher of the Year from the Organizations of American Historians. Welcome, Lois. Thank you. I'm going to pull the screen and start my presentation just so that you uh, note that uh, I have to be back in class by 1230. So my little assistant that's with me is uh, is Evan. I want to introduce him. Um, Evan is from Grants Pass High School and uh, he and I, he's been in my classroom, I think twice. And so he's going to help me a little bit uh, with monitoring questions and interrupting me if I'm not clarifying something or something that uh, we know. I'm going to go, I'm going to fly through this. So if you watch the screen, you're going to see a lot of images. I just want to say one thing, and I didn't realize Sally was going to say it, you know, this is Black History Month, but I really think we should be having Black History Month every month because Black history is American history. And when I teach it in the classroom, and I've been doing that for about, with American history since the year 2000, I'm weaving it in all year long because it really is the starting of our nation in 1619. So this is, this really, uh, I, I think we shouldn't look at it as it's separate, is it all together? But what I'm gonna talk about today is the heroic civil rights era. Uh, in particular, I'm gonna talk about 1963, but I'm gonna kind of break with the narrative. I work with some historians in the summer, uh, uh, one in particular that calls it the heroic civil rights era. And it, that's going to be like from uh, 1954, starting with the heroic part is starting with Brown versus the Board of Education. 
uh, that decision all the way to probably 1970, 1968 is the assassination of Martin Luther King. And so uh, what Peniel Joseph, who just wrote a recent book on Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, he talks about this period being the heroic uh, period. Um, in my uh, opinion, the, her the heroic period also starts with the death of this man, this young man, uh, Emmett Till. This was a riveting uh, death in the country. And it was a young uh, uh, black boy that was from Chicago, Illinois. He went down to visit his relatives in the South. Uh, he said hi to a white woman and he ended up uh, uh, being uh, kidnapped by five white men. Uh, two of them that killed him, wrapped a, a, a uh, air conditioner around his neck and threw him in a river. Uh, uh, then his, when they sent the body back home, this is a very, this is a big moment in American history. I teach about it. His mother, Mamie Teal, was absolutely devastated as any of us would be, but she decided to open the casket to see what they had done to his, her boy. And this really launches the, the complete anger. We're not going to put up with this anymore. This had been happening to young black men for a long time, but opening the casket was an important moment. So we'll see these moments. We saw this summer with, uh, uh, with the George Floyd uh, taping release, which I have not, I, I can't look at this stuff. It's too much for me. But uh, this heroic period is a very interesting period because you're going to see some famous people come about, but I want to break the narrative. I want to break up the narrative saying that this whole period is just not about Martin Luther King. There are many famous black women and black men that were part of the movement that we don't teach about. And so I really uh, want to emphasize other people in the movement. Ella Baker is really famous for organizing. She had early on organized in the thirties and the forties, and she'll be uh, prominent in the fifties. There's two uh, in the 60s. There's two women that I really love. Diane Nash, I look, I encourage you to look her up. She really uh, starts with the Freedom Rides. She's an amazing woman. And uh, I think she recently died, but uh, she's a hero to me. And the other one, I'm moving very fast here because I'm trying to get to the big event. Fannie Lou Hamer, my goodness, there's a five foot four woman that just didn't take no, a former sharecropper. And um, she's giving a speech to Congress that was so powerful that Lyndon Johnson wanted it interrupted so he could get on there. It was a tough speech, but boy, she's wonderful. Uh, there's men in the movement too that are not as celebrated today. Um, uh, there's uh, these men and I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, Baird Rustin was really one of the architects of the civil rights movement. He's not put up in front. King will use him uh, and A. Uh, Philip Randolph will use him um, in the March on Washington. So he's going to be the big mind behind the March on Washington. And King loves him as an organizer, but he's not always put up front because he was also a gay black man, but brilliant. Bayard Rustin is brilliant and he should be taught many, uh, a lot more. James Lawson's another giant um, in the civil rights movement. I absolutely love what he says here. And if you notice, I'm not reading the PowerPoint to you. That's the cardinal rule uh, in teaching that you let pe people can read and look at images at the same time. But I absolutely love what James Lawson uh, writes here about being a child of God and what it means to turn the other cheek. Um, he is the one that really teaches Diane Nash and, and the next guy I'm gonna talk about, John Lewis and, and, and Martin Luther King. He's really behind the movements of the sit-ins and the early civil rights movement. And of course, if you listen this summer when John Lewis died, he spoke and he's still a powerful, powerful man. And then there's the great John Lewis. Uh, he talks about getting in good trouble. And so hopefully today uh, by my presentation, John Lewis will inspire you. I always say you should be doing good trouble. And we're gonna see some good trouble today. We're gonna be talking about 1960. Hey, Ms. Mac? Yes, go ahead. Before you move on, I have a question. You bet. So Baird Rustin, we know that he was in the closet. So why was he not up in the front? He just, he, he wasn't totally in the closet. He's going to be arrested about, I want to say like 1949, 40, uh, 50 uh, in, in a, a sting in uh, Los Angeles. And so the reason that they didn't put him forth is because they didn't want the movement to fall down. But he's so good, Evan, that he's still going to be part of the movement. He just won't be in the front line, right? 
And um, one within the movement too, there was a lot of homophobic behavior. Uh, one uh, uh, representative from New York City said, listen, if you don't get Bayard Rustin out of the front of the, uh, what was it? Adam Clayton Powell was the one said, if you don't get him out of this organization and get him out of the front, I'm going to imply that King and Rustin had a, a homosexual relationship. So, you know, they're really going to use that kind of stuff, Evan, and we wouldn't do that now. I mean, in today's uh, world, you, you don't see the world like that, right? But back then, the, he didn't want to, uh, didn't want the movement to suffer. Um, it does sound really ridiculous to us now, but back then, uh, it was part of what was happening or the fabric. And here's the key. King didn't give him up. King understood the strength of his, 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 the strength of his, uh, his organizational skills, him and, and Ella Baker is another one, uh, just by the way, it's also women are not going to be raised up. I mean, we always hear about Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King was great, but there's other people in the movement that we're also part of the movement. So I, what I want you to do is I wanna break that, that cycle of we have one guy at the top, because it really isn't, there's many people part of it. And 1963 is a huge year in, in American history. You got the Cold War, here's Kennedy giving the speech in Berlin. You've got a lot of civil rights things happen. And we'll talk a little bit about George Wallace and where he won't let uh, kids into the University of Alabama. Uh, you've got uh, the March on Washington that's going to happen after what we're going to talk about today in Birmingham. Um, we have the murder of, uh, of uh, oh gosh, what's his, I, I just lost his name. Gosh, I love him. Uh, I, I, I'll get it here in a minute. He was murdered by, gosh darn it. It's a couple of weeks after, oh, what's his name? Somebody help me. What is his name? Thank you, Medgar Evers. Jeez, I can't believe I wouldn't remember. But of course, and I put this together, I just kind of have some spots. But the death of Medgar Evers is huge too. Too. I mean, uh, King isn't the only guy that was assassinated. You've got uh, Malcolm X later on, but the big one here in my mind is the loss of Medgar Evers. Um, and you have the Vietnam War. I mean, uh, in the middle of 1963, you're going to have right before the, the uh, protests that we're going to look at in Birmingham, you have the self-immolation of the Buddhist monk in Vietnam. So there's a lot of things going on. You have decolonization going on around the world. And for, for African-Americans, people like especially Kwame Nkrumah are really important in the movement and how, how they see themselves. And you have assassination. Of course, you have DM in Vietnam. And one week later, you have the Kennedy assassin, John F. Kennedy's assassination. So you have all this stuff happening in 1963, but we are going to look at the Children's Crusade um, in Birmingham, Alabama. There's going to be a party uh, at the park tonight. And um, it, it's, a, it's one of the famous ones. I think it's, uh, for me, this is when we understand agency, what happens, uh, what kids can do to change the world. And I always pose this question and be, uh, Evan, if you have any questions in the, the chat, I'm just flying through this. So if people want to stop and ask a question, I can certainly answer it. But I always pose this question, how can students exhibit resilience in times of crisis? And the key here is resilience and crisis. Now we are in a crisis now with uh, COVID-19. This summer we had the BLM protests, which uh, I was part of, I know Evan was part of, but we, we really have to teach our kids resilience. And this, this example in 1963 of the children in Birmingham, it's an example of resilience and changing the world as we see it. It's gonna be kids that come forward. So in the chat window, can, and maybe you can monitor this, Evan, uh, what historical figures do you know have served time in jail or prison? for a purpose, not, you know, not anything that, that, that was against society. Do we have any people that put, uh, Evan, can you think of anybody? Well, we know there was Martin Luther King. Yes, very good. And did Malcolm X serve time in jail? Yes, he did. And, um, you know, uh, Evan, you asked me that. I wrote a paper last, last year on Martin Luther, or Malcolm X and Martin Luther King's time in jail and their influence uh, of Kwame Nkrumah's time in jail, who is uh, the first president of Ghana. Um, jail is going to change Malcolm X for the better. So uh, he didn't go to jail because he, he, he was against something. Um, 
Uh, and Nelson Mandela, Amy, you're exactly right. John Lewis went to jail, that's correct. And Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. Oh, that's a nice one, Nicole, really nice. So, uh, and of course, probably the most famous in the 20th century is uh, Nelson Mandela. And I teach Nel Nel Nelson Mandela. He's an amazing guy to teach. And when he walks out of his 27 years on, on uh, oh, what is the island? I, I want to say Easter Island. Uh, I can't remember the name of the prison. He's going to walk out without bitterness. And he's really going to- Robin, Robin's Island. Thank you, Robin's Island. I couldn't remember it at the last minute. So uh, Nelson Mandela is probably the most famous. And Birmingham is going to give us the uh, opportunity as historians or the opportunity as a society to see what where Martin Luther King is thinking or what he's thinking and where his thoughts are at that time. So I, I love this, but we're not gonna fo focus as much on King. Of course, King is famous for being arrested, but this picture is not in 1963. This is a, a, when he was arrested in Montgomery in 1956. And when he led the Montgomery bo bus boycott, he was one of the big organizers that starts uh, or that successfully breaks the segregation on Montgomery buses. So, uh, you know, he, he is really into organizing here. Um, so I'm gonna start with the story uh, before 1963, what's happening in the, the civil rights movement, this heroic movement. We have the lunch counter sit-ins that was really started with uh, Jim Lawson uh, or, or, or Reverend Jim Lawson. John Lewis will be part of that, uh, uh, Diane Nash. Uh, Marion Barry, uh, another guy that was not, uh, he becomes the mayor of Washington, D.C., but uh, he's another guy that participated in these lunch counter sit-ins. And in these sit-ins, kids, kids, they're, and they're college kids at first, uh, are going to be taught how to react nonviolently. They're going to take that Gandhian view of nonviolence, that you don't change society violently, that you change it with nonviolence, and they're gonna embrace this. Lawson went to India, he studied. I think he met, uh, he met Gandhi, I'm pretty sure he did. Baird Rustin will go to India also and study nonviolence, but he will go the year after Gandhi went. Uh, then there's the Freedom Rides of 1962. Diane Nash will be part of this. John Lewis will be part of this. This is a, a harrowing uh, study. And this is when you're really seeing uh, the, that uh, we're not going to give up the desegregation of the South. Um, now, freedom rides had been done by Baird, uh, Baird Rustin, by the way, in the 1940s, the late 1940s. So this wasn't the first time, but it's going to be at its uh, apex in 1962 when uh, they try to desegregate bus, uh, bus terminals um, on uh, bus, buses coming into different cities in, in the South. Uh, at the top of, uh, of 1963 in the state of Alabama, that's where we're going next. We are gonna stay in Alabama from now on. The governor, the new governor of Alabama is this guy, George Wallace. Now, George Wallace is gonna deliver one of the great speeches uh, in civil rights history where he says that in the state of Alabama, they're gonna keep segregation now, segregation tomorrow and segregation forever. He is not going to be desegregated. And of course, you're also going to have this guy in 1963. I mean, if you were uh, casting a movie, uh, this, this guy, the great villain, will be the perfect villain, will be Bull Connor. Now, Bull Connors was the sheriff slash mayor. They were, uh, by the way, in Birmingham at this time, they were changing the form of city government. So he had just been, he had been voted out uh, many of the moderate whites in Birmingham wanted him out because their businesses were starting to suffer uh, in Birmingham. Uh, don't forget that the Montgomery bus boycott was about economics. If black people are getting on the bus and they have to sit in the back, they're not riding on the bus. So you're not going to get my quarter. And again, again, this is going to be a ploy in Birmingham. There are white businessmen in Birmingham that are done with the extreme, extreme methods of Bull Connor. And he's voted out when all this happens, but he's not gonna step down. He's, he's gonna say, hey, listen, we, we haven't decided, I'm still in charge. And what he said is true, um, damn the law down here, we make our own law. 
So he doesn't care about the federal laws. He doesn't care, care about anything. We're going to do what we want. We're ruling. So there's a lot of conflict within the white community in Birmingham also. There's also conflict in the black community. You've got people that want to change. I'll talk about one guy here in a minute. And there's other ones that are just like still um, in the middle. Like I, I don't, I, we don't have to be in a hurry. Um, this is kind of a slight one here, Evan. Um, uh, what movie do you think opened in 1963 in Birmingham, right before this all hits? Would it be To Kill a Mockingbird? Yeah, you're right. To Kill a Mockingbird opened in 1962, but it will only uh, uh, be seen in Birmingham in 1963. And of course, what a, a wonderful precursor to what's going to happen. So this is the hero of the day, in my opinion. It's Re Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. He's going to be really behind everything that happens in Birmingham. Now, he was with the, uh, I want to make sure, the Bethel Baptist Church in Birmingham. Now, uh, and he was a fiery speaker. I just want a uh, side note. I'm looking at my time. A side note here. Fred Shuttlesworth is one of the most amazing men in civil rights history. And uh, we had him come for uh, to some high school students up in Northern California, um, up in Eureka. So we had him fly him in, we had a grant and he came in and he was 80, I wanna say he was 83 years old when he flew in. So he was an old man when we met him and we brought him to the high school. And when he, kids are coming in the high school, that man had the energy of a 20 year old. He's saying, you know, God bless you, praise the Lord when everybody's coming in. And we were a little nervous as public school teachers are like, oh my gosh, he's acting like this is a church. Well, it was church to him. Everything was the church to him and everything was uh, this moral uh, pull of doing the right thing. Nobody was as fiery as Fred Shellsworth. And when he spoke to the kids, he brought down the house. He still spoke like a young man uh, when we, we saw him in Northern California. Um, one, one of the black preachers that didn't want to do anything in Birmingham that said, you know what, things are okay here in Birmingham. We shouldn't be rocking the boat came to him and said, you know, uh, Fred, I heard from the Lord that we we need to like slow it down and, and not have this big meeting we're gonna have. It was right before the major meetings that were gonna happen here, what I talk about in a minute. And he said, really? Is that what the Lord said? Well, would you tell the Lord when you see him again that he needs to come to me in person to tell me that? But until that happens, I'm running this meeting. So he was super fiery and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, Fred Shuttlesworth is also really tough. He's going to be beaten up and sent to the hospital. Uh, some white men are going to uh, beat him up with, with brass knuckles. They're going to break a couple of ribs and they will hurt him. They will bomb his house. Um, Birmingham is called Bombingham for a reason. Uh, in, 19, from 19, in the beginning of 1962 to 1963, the year before this happens, there's going to be 60 homes bombed, 60 black homes bombed, and six churches in Birmingham. And Sh Fred Shuttlesworth barely makes this out alive. So uh, Shuttlesworth is still going to keep going forward. He really believes in the movement. And what he's going to start is called Project C. That's the movement in Birmingham that starts what happens next. Um, Evan, what do you think the word C stands for? Courage. Oh, uh, you had to have courage, Evan. You're right there. It's not C, it's not courage. Let's see in the chat if anybody can figure out what does the C stand for? Anybody have a guess? Evan, you have a guess? Do we have any guesses, Evan? Uh, there, I see civil rights oh, and civil culture. No. no. What are they going to do? This is a C. Oh, I thought maybe we could get it. Uh, my classroom got it, so uh, we were, I, maybe my kids are understanding where I'm going. Change is good, Juliet. I like that, but it's going to be con a confrontation, project confrontation, and the first thing they're going to confront is the economics of it. They're going to they're going to say in Birmingham, and and Birmingham is the most segregated city in the South. That's even according to Martin Luther King. When King arrives, and I'll talk about that in a minute, he says this is the most segregated place in the South. So if we can break this, we can break anything. Um, they're going to, and the project is, according to what uh, uh, Shuttlesworth uh, sets up, 
is that you're not buying from, from white businesses that don't allow us to try our clothes on in, in, in dressing rooms, that don't allow us to use the bathroom, that don't allow us to sit at the, the counters. And they also picketed uh, those businesses. So this is all out and they're gonna attack this project confrontation. Uh, we'll start with the economics of it. They'll have huge meetings in their churches and people will come out to the churches. And, and so this is their first, their first thing they're going to do. And of course, when they start this, Shuttlesworth invites King, uh, Martin Luther King and the great Ralph Abernathy to Birmingham to help with this movement, to give it a little bit more power underneath. Now, I just want to say uh, something in the background here. King is coming off quite a few fa failures uh, that had happened. You know, he got very famous for the Montgomery bus boycott. But six months before Birmingham, he had gone to Al, uh, Albany, and Albany had been a failure. They failed to desegregate Albany. So when we think about how easy it is to desegregate a city and to demand that you have equal rights, it's a lot harder than you think. And it wasn't easy. So a lot of times we we teach it like, oh, it was really easy. Martin Luther King came up, gave up. Everybody just got their senses and they did it. And that's not what happened. There were a lot of failures uh, on the list that King had experienced. So coming into Birmingham, he, uh, he, uh, he is not, uh, ex, uh, he is not, they don't think he's going to get it done. Shuttlesworth wants some more press in this uh, case. He needs the, the, the Christian uh uh, ministers behind him in this movement. And I also want to emphasize something else about um, the movement. The movement has this uh, evangelical Christians behind it. Uh, definitely uh, Shuttlesworth is evangelical all the way. It's a Chris, it, this is a church movement too, coming out of the black churches. So when I teach it, I don't de-emphasize that at all. Um, I, this is a powerful religious movement. So they're going to bring them in uh, and they're going to be talking about what happened. But the, the main guy is going to be uh, Shuttlesworth. Now, King was supposed to, and this is kind of some background. I'll talk about the books that I used to talk about this. But King, by the way, did not want to go to jail that Friday. Uh, he was supposed to go to jail Good Friday. They were going to break, they were breaking uh, the, a local law about uh, protesting. And uh, a warrant was out for their arrest, all three of them, uh, Shuttlesworth, Abernathy, and King. And King did not really want to go to jail. He's definitely on the fence. He's not wanting to go. And he thought maybe he could be more useful if he left Birmingham. And he says this in the meeting, his uh, left Birmingham and raised some money. Uh, so uh, he doesn't really want to go to jail. And his father also didn't want him to go to jail. His father... <laughs> Uh, Daddy King will fly into Birmingham when he finds out that he might try to go to jail or walk into the jail saying, I don't want you going. And Fred Shuttlesworth loses his temper. I don't want another merit narrative I want to emphasize is these guys aren't all sitting in a room behaving. They're going to disagree on what is being done. And I'm going to say a bad word here in a minute. But Fred Shuttlesworth is going to, King is saying, you know, maybe I should leave. Maybe I shouldn't go to church, go to jail this Friday. He was going to jail, by the way, on Good Friday. And Shuttlesworth goes, are you kidding me? Are you really going to leave town? Okay, Mr. Big. And he says this, this is in the two book, both books that I use to talk about this. He said, okay, Mr. Big, uh, you go ahead and leave, just like you did in Albany. But if you leave this movement, you'll be Mr. Shit. And he said that in the meeting. Now, uh, King will go to jail and he will uh, write the famous uh, letter to the Birmingham jail, which wasn't really popular in 1963. It'll be much more popular in 1964 when a New York, uh, New York uh, uh, radio guy reads the letter and it'll become much more famous. And of course, we study it uh, virulently, virulently in school now. Uh, Evan, uh, these are three of the quotes that uh, uh, they say uh, what, uh, if anybody, I'd like everybody um, in the chat to pick their favorite out of the three, but Evan, what is your favorite of these three and why? Um, my favorite is justice too long delayed is justice denied. You like that? I've, I feel, yes, because I feel like we can relate to it. Well, at least my generation can relate to it, at least with these Black Lives Matter, well, Black Lives Matter protests. 
because people have been African Americans have just been beaten up by police for so many decades that I mean, of course, people have been fighting for it now, but it's just a big wave of movements coming now. And I, you know what I love too, Evan, that you bring that up. I mean, you're young and I'm old. This has been going on for hundreds of years uh, as far as I'm concerned. But um, what is wonderful about Black Lives Matter is there isn't like a person to talk. It was started by the way, by three women after the death of Trayvon Martin. And so Black Lives Matters has been around, but this movement this summer was so wonderful, right? Because everybody's coming. It didn't matter uh, you know, who you were, everybody was outraged. And that's why they went to the streets, even during a pandemic. I don't know about you, but it blows me away. And I, I would agree, uh, all three of those are amazing. I encourage you to go to the letter of the Birmingham jail. Uh, it's such a great letter. I teach it, but that would take another whole thing. I want to get to what happens is that uh, they, they are, the other part of project confrontation is they want to fill the jails. That's going to be the big uh, thing they're going to do. So economically, they're going to hit them in the pocketbook. But the other thing they're going to do is they're going to fill the jails. That's what they want to do. And so that's why King Abernathy and Shuttlesworth wants to fill the jails. The problem is everybody goes to the big church meeting and sings and says, I'm going to do something. But if you ask adults in Birmingham in 1963 to go to jail, if they go to jail, it's highly likely that those adults will lose their job. So they tried to convince the people of Birmingham, King, Abernathy, and Shuttlesworth, you know, get arrested. But a lot of them won't show up to get arrested. The first day that they start this campaign to fill the jail, 25 will, will uh, be arrested. The next day, it'll go down to 10. They can't get people to, adults to do it. So the idea comes up with this guy, James Bevel, one of the other big movement, uh, one of the big disciples of Jim, uh, J James Lawson. And he says, let's fill the jails with kids. Kids will go to jail. And King is against it. King is like, I, I don't think we should be filling the jails. This is not a good idea. No, we're not sending kids. And then uh, again, Shuttlesworth comes in and he says this, and I love this. I have to remember this when I'm teaching kids. Oh yeah, let's let the kids do it. Raise them so there'll be people on their own. Let's trust the kids. And they were gonna send the kids to jail that were under 15. So there's gonna be thousands here in a minute that I talk about. Now, uh, and he will say, uh, it's, and he will say to the kids when he teaches the kids and kids are going to come to before this, this, uh, this movement, you are, they are going to teach kids how to react nonviolently. So you're going to go to church on, or you're going to go to the churches that were in Birmingham on Saturday mornings, not at school. You're going to come and you're going to learn the nonviolent way. And he says, Hey, it's going to be a silent demonstration. No songs, no slogans, no replies to obscenities. However, when you're arrested, go ahead and sing your heart out. All right. So he's going to do that now. So, and I want to say one more thing. I'm not going to go into it, but there were a lot of groups, kids that are already come together and they were sick and tired of um, being oppressed. So they're going to have their own organizations among themselves. One of them was a group of girls called the Peace Ponies. Um, these girls are from age 10 to 14 and they really want to bring about peace and they knew what they were signing up for. So there's going to be a party. So on D-Day, uh, it's going to be launched by uh, popular DJ Shelly Stewart, who usually started off his radio show with good gobbly wobbly timber, let, the fall, let it fall. And he dropped this needle on a spinning record and he'd play like Sam Cooke or, or James Brown. But this day he said, kids, uh, bring your toothbrush, br toothbrushes because lunch will be served at Kelly Ingram Park. Yep, there's gonna be a party today. And I hope you can see this. I'm just gonna show you about 30 seconds. At 11 o'clock, all the kids in Birmingham and all the schools that are within eight to 10 miles of Birmingham are going to skip school. They're gonna jump out of the windows. Uh, they're gonna jump, go right out the door and they're all gonna come out. They knew what the signal was. Now, what's great about this is some of the kids that were eight miles away, they would uh, they would walk all the way into Birmingham for this protest. 
Now they're going to walk to a church that is that they're all going to congregate at the same church. And when they walk out of the church, they're going to send them in, in waves, waves of about 200. And on this first day, they're going to send out a thousand kids, a thousand kids. And the kids are going to walk out and they're going to be, this is going to be a very organized march. And they were warned, nobody is going to get violent. Nobody's going to say anything, no obscenities, nothing. You're going to behave. And when they send them out, they know they're going to get arrested. Here's some of the pictures of some of the kids that are arrested. I love all these pictures. Now, when we get here into the end, if it should make you laugh, you know kids are gonna start making faces and they're gonna fill up the jails. On the first day, a th around a thousand kids are arrested. On the third day of protest, 3000 are arrested. So <clears throat> I d it just makes me laugh. Now, when they are arrested, I don't even think the kids knew how bad it was gonna get. Bull Connor is gonna say, no way. And of course, they're going to walk down to Kelly Ingram Park. Park. Kelly Ingram Park had been desegregated. Only white people could uh, uh, go there. So they're going to break the rule. And they closed the park, by the way, because then when they said they had to desegregate. And of course, we've all seen these pictures where the kids, uh, the kids are going to be attacked by water hoses, by dogs. Uh, in one of the books that I read, the kids talk about when the water hit them, it was like pulling their skin off and it was awful. Um, and the kids are going to still continue to protest. This is a huge movement. And of course, at the same time, George Wallace, that I think on the third day of the protest, George Wallace will also stand um, at the, the, the door. Now the Kennedy brothers are fully involved, calling down to Birmingham saying, don't be sending those kids. This is terrible what's happening. All this is going on the nightly news and Kennedy's had enough. And so Kennedy gives, it all kind of comes together, but Kennedy gives what I consider one of the great civil rights speeches ever. He gives us on June 11th, 1963. And I'm just gonna show you the beginning. Oh, I'm too long. I'm not gonna show you this. You guys all heard it when he says it's a moral problem. Now that looks like a victory, but um, in September of that same year, we'll see the bombing of the church um, of the four little girls. And we all know about this, it was terrible. And it reminds me of 2016 when, when at Emmanuel Lutheran, our, I think I have the wrong name. You'll see that these, uh, these, these people, these worshipers, especially Clementia Pickney will be killed in a house of worship. So I don't know uh, when this- Emmanuel A-M-E. Thank you, Emmanuel. I couldn't remember what it was. Thank you so much. Uh, this was just, it should be troubling for everyone because I couldn't believe that we were still living. I thought we were back in 1963, but now somebody went into the church and killed these wonderful people. Um, and so uh, I just want to, I'm, I'm trying to speed it up. Uh, these are the three books that I suggest that you read about uh, the agency that kids took in Birmingham in 1963. And I usually end this talk, I won't today because I'm way long um, of uh, Sam. Yeah. I don't, I don't even, I, that poor young man must have, uh, I don't like even saying his name, right? Uh, I feel sorry for him, but Dylan Roof did kill all those kids, all those people. And, and uh, I still think it's what, you know, the only movement that I saw in 2016, at least the Confederate flag was taken off a of federal property that all those states said, that's enough. I, I don't know. Uh, oh, wonderful, Sam. I like that idea, the Black Church documentary. So Sally, I'm going to stop there. I don't, I have more, but I hope that I wasn't boring. I was kind of moving. What I want you to understand is that the, the civil right, the narrative of the civil rights movement, especially that narrative of the, the, uh, the heroic period is of ordinary people like you and me. It's not just some big high guy like uh, Martin Luther King or Fred Charlesworth. It's everyday kids that really had that movement going. I consider that thing that happened in Birmingham with the kids, one of the greatest movements in American history and what bravery and courage it took. So we can have that kind of agency in our own community. Thank you so much. And no, I don't think you're boring at all. In fact, um, I, I would like to come back to high school and be in, be in your class. Well, I, I hope that I wasn't too long. Sorry, I just was trying to no. move us 
as I could. No, we some. some I, uh, I know you have a class to go off to teach, but I know there was a question way up. I think Amy okay. asked. Um, let's see here. What U.S. history book would you recommend for an accurate retelling that acknowledges Black contributions and includes 400 years of economic suppression resulting in the disparities we have now? I think that anything by Hassan Jeffries. He's from uh, Ohio State University. Um, I just, we just did a book, uh, a book talk with him, with teachers. He does the civil rights movement and how to teach it, but it really gives a nice narrative. Uh, Hassan Jeffries is the brother of uh, the Jeffries that's in Congress. He was the representative that uh, spoke at the impeachment. And I, I, he was one of the trial attorneys in this recent thing. I, I'm a huge fan of Jeffries. Uh, Hassan Jeffries is fantastic. Anything by him and anytime you can see him speak. The other one is Peniel Joseph, anything by him, the recent uh, book on Martin Luther King. But Peniel Joseph uh, and Malcolm X, Peniel Joseph did a book on the history of civil rights. I can't remember the name of it. I worked with Peniel uh, last summer. Oh God, what is it called? But he does a really nice thorough job. But I just really think that you should be looking, if you can read just about one event and get deep into it, I, I think that's always better. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Ms. Yeah, Mack? I, I'm sorry. I'm just flying. And usually I let kids come in and I'm not talking so much. I'm sorry. Hi, Jessica. How are you? Oh, gosh. Now there's a brave kid. If I wish I was as bright and brave as my Jessica. Hello, Jess. God, I love that kid. Oh, I miss you. Call me, would you? Hi. Hi I miss you, too. <laughs> now that's a kid. Class together. Oh, I love you. And you and she was one of my brilliant students. I mean, that kid has courage. I would not want to get in your way, Jessica. And Jessica, <laughs> did you know about this event? I didn't teach you. No, this. it's weird oh. that I've never even heard about it. Um, Wilson covered a lot of really important stuff when I took advanced American literature, like um, Emmett Till and a lot of that stuff that I'd never heard about before. And so I'm surprised I haven't heard about this one before either. Well, I got to, I'll talk to Wilson then. <laughs> yeah, I actually really liked this class. He did a really great job with um, Isn't he civil terrific? rights. Yeah. Well, and I just think the civil rights movement is so big. So, uh, mm -hmm. and another thing that we don't teach about is Garveyism. I mean, uh, Marcus Garvey in the 1920s, that's another place that we should go. I mean, to really understand. So uh, there's just so much to teach. Uh, w. Du Bois, there's another one you should look into. But I'm telling you, women right now, Ella Baker, Ella Baker, she's amazing. That's the one. Oh, God, I would love to be Ella Baker. What, really what about what about Ida B. Wells? Oh, you know what I have? Uh, listen, Reverend, you know what I do? My <laughs> kids have to make a monument. What kind of monument should we do to the great Ida B. Wells and her relationship? with Frederick Douglass, that's what I focus on. Uh, you know, she, she he meant her, sir, but oh my God, we look directly at uh, her her pamphlet on lynching and, and where's that that's coming from. She's another great one. And of course, lynching was directly connected to the economics of the situation. Every time you looked at somebody, um, the, the economics, they were in interrupting uh, uh, white, uh, people in the South, they felt like that their economics were being disturbed. So you were, they were lynching uh, men, especially that her original book, um, it, it, the young man that, that she originally wrote about, he was lynched because his grocery store was successful. So economics, money has to do with this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so if that helps, I don't know. So I hope that I wasn't, is there any other questions? I know I was too fast. I didn't, Usually there's a lot more give and take, but I had too much to do. So, um, and I, I just, I, I just am going to say this one. I know this is black history. We have agency in this community. We can do it. And black history is American history. We should be doing it every month. So, and native American history and gay history. And let's see Latino. Oh, I'm, I'm just into that. So I don't know as much about that. Uh, but I, I'd like to weave that into my teaching a lot more. And of course, women. Women are smarter than men. We can't help it. That's just the way it is. So. <laughs> we have another question in the chat. Any recommendations on how we can stay up to date on modern history that's being made? I just, you know, there's a recent book on voting. That's my bigger concern right now. And uh, I have it right here. I'm going to tell you, this is the book. And I have a couple copies if you want one. Just a minute. Carol Anderson's, this is the, a recent book that I think really gives a good one, One Person, No Vote. 
Boy, uh, this came out before what happened uh, in November. Boy, she hit that one on the head. And that gives you a really uh, how voter suppressing suppression is destroying our democracy. This is a book and she's amazing. So, uh, and if you need, I have a couple of copies of this because I taught it to uh, about 50 teachers. So uh, that's a good how, question. How can I get it from you? Uh, just uh, Sally will give you my email. I'll drop okay. it off. Great. All right. So, okay, guys, I gotta go. My kids are gonna learn the French Revolution. We're gonna cut some heads off. So, uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> thank you, Evan. Love you. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. All right. So, I am gonna go ahead and pop up a, a quiz, a poll here, and it's something that you can take on your own. Just a moment. Okay. So. <clears throat> Self quiz, uh, read through this list and keep a tally just for yourself. And if you recognize the person or reference, um, even if you just heard about it in, this, in the last half hour here, if you, ref if you recognize it enough that you could give a brief synopsis, give yourself two whole points. If you have heard about it, you get one point. And if you've never heard about it, no points. So just go ahead and give yourself a little score right now. You don't have to share it with anybody, just for yourself. And then uh, Reverend Ernestine, when you're ready, you can go ahead and take over. Well, we, we decided we were gonna talk about a few people. And so on this list, I have, uh, I have uh, Ida B. Wells, which uh, Lois already talked about, and she was a journalist. And what really she's known about was documenting lynchings. And she would go uh, across the country documenting lynchings and of course you know that didn't make her very popular she was the part owner of a of a newspaper in memphis tennessee it was, it was called the free speech and the offices got bombed and so they they decided that she needed to leave town and but she did not stop doing what she was doing she continued to do to report the lynching she went around the, the country reporting on it mostly during the reconstruction era and she was one of the founders of the NAACP and so that's who Ida B. Wells was and she was a very tiny woman and very dynamic woman and one of the things I recommend to people if you get a chance I guess when, when we get to to travel again is to go to the Smithsonian uh, uh, Black History Mu Museum of History and Culture it is fabulous uh, the other person I had was Marcus Garvey, and I don't know if many people know about him. He was uh, he was Jamaican, but he was a black nationalist, and really he was one of the leaders of the Pan Africanist movement. And he was um, he was uh, one of the the key movers and shakers behind the uh, the Back to Africa movement. And and the reason I I'm familiar with Marcus Garvey and the reason I I know about him so well is that my husband, whose family was originally from the United States, they moved to immigrated to Liberia as part of the, the Back to Africa movement. And my first son is, well, I'm my only son, is called Marcus because of Marcus Garvey. So uh, that he has a, has a special place in my heart. And he was the, uh, what, he was the leader of, of one of the largest mass movements and that was the black africa movement and and he was the one of his quotes that we'd say or i used to say black is beautiful that came from marcus garvey too and the final person that i am going to well the final thing i'm going to talk about is um lift every voice and sing and uh, that is uh it's a hymn but it was originally a poem that was written by um James Weldon Johnson and the music was uh, was uh, written by his brother, uh, Rosamond, Rosamond Johnson. And they asked him to, he was a professor, he taught at a school in, in, uh, Flo in yeah, Florida. And they asked him to write a, a speech for the anniversary of Lincoln's birthday. And instead of writing a speech, he wrote the poem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And again, that has become now known as the, the Black National Anthem. And uh, 
whenever we sing it, uh, it is it is the tradition for African Americans to stand and acknowledge that. And really, you you can hear the tune, but you need to you need to read the the verses, which are very powerful. I'm not going to read them here for you, but if you could look it up and read the verses and, and follow it, it's it's really very powerful. And that's those are the three things I was going to talk about today. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. So we normally like to have some time for breakout rooms, but we're approaching one o'clock. So I'm going to ask the question to all of us here together. Um, so if anybody would like to share their thoughts on this, please do. And then we also have some songs we're going to share. Uh, I'm going to post a video at the end for us to look at. So the question is, is Black history relevant to your understanding of race relations? I'm going to ask that again. Is Black history relevant to your understanding of race relations? So if anybody would like to unmute themselves and share, please do. Or you can put things into the chat as well. And you can also, if you have any feedback about what you learned today or anything you want to share, that's, that's we're open to anything. Please join in. Let's see, uh, Black history is American history. And Black history is Black future, American future, yes. Okay. Knowledge of the past gives perspective for what is happening today. And as I, I said at the beginning, you know, I grew up thinking, um, not, not really realizing what the problem was. I wasn't taught about the problem and I was taught to be loving and accepting. And, and you still, I'm sure you all hear it today. Like, well, why is this still a problem? You'll hear, hear people say that. And, and it, to me, um, knowing this history and what the impact it, it's had and, we, and not covering it up, um, being able to acknowledge it. And um, let's see, Travis was just about to mention Throughline. Okay, so Throughline is an NPR podcast, has a great episode on Marcus Garvey. And actually, Jenny, if you could repost some of the links. So we have a link to share with you for signing up for community action. And then we also have one for Oregon history. So we've done some research for you and you can click on the links in there to learn some more about our own history here in Oregon. And um, our next meeting, so we are meeting Courageous Conversations on uh, fourth Tuesdays of every month. So because March is 28 days, our next one will also be on the 23rd, March 23rd, noon to one. And we always use the same link to get here. Normally you can go to our RCC, our Road Community College website to our diversity programming and get the link. Um, today our, our site is down. Um, so if you save this link, you'll always have it. And um, if there's anything, anything anybody else wants to say, otherwise I will go into sharing my screen for some music. Oh, and Jenny, also, we have a link to the music. So if you're not able to watch it, it's the Portland Lesbian Choir. They did a virtual concert on, I think it was February 6th, earlier this month. And they do a variety of, of work. Um, there's a couple, the one that I'm gonna show has, has to do with Black Lives Matter. Um, there are songs about uh, domestic violence, um, about lifting your voice up and um, moving forward with love. It's inspirational, it's tender, it's really joyful. So. I am going to go ahead and share my screen now and I hope you can stay a few more moments and watch. Hi, my name is Nikki. My pronouns are she and her. I've been a member of the Portland Lesbian Choir since the fall of 2018. I sing soprano and I also serve on the production committee. Ella's song was written by Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan, a founding member of the Grammy award-winning African-American all-female acapella group, Sweet Honey in the Rock. Dr. Reagan was deeply inspired by one of the most influential women of the civil rights movement, Ella Josephine Baker. Though Baker's work was mostly behind the scenes, she is easily recognized as one of the most important African-American leaders of the 20th century. The lyrics and concept of Ella's song are taken directly from Ella Baker's words. Until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons, 
becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of a white mother's son. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until this happens. The struggle is eternal. The tribe increases. Somebody else carries on. It has been almost 40 years since Dr. Reagan honored Ella Baker by artfully putting her words to music and 60 years since Baker first spoke them, but their sentiments ring true today more than ever. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. from my home here in Baltimore, Maryland, where I am so honored and excited for the Portland Lesbian Choir to premiere the treble edition of Say Her Name. 35 winters ago, my family began celebrating Kwanzaa as our chosen winter holiday. And before we lit a single candle, 
we would begin every year with a libation ceremony where we would pour water and say the names of our ancestors, both historical and familial. Harriet Tubman, Ashe. Sojourner Truth, Ashe. Josie Spellman, Ashe. Lucy Green, Ashe. And as we would say the names of the men and women and people who had come before us and paved the way for us to enjoy life as we know it, there would be a sense of love in the room. There would be a sense of legacy in the room. And those memories were with me this summer as I began to think about the many Black Americans who have lost their lives due to police brutality. As you hear the singers tonight calling out the names of those we have lost, I invite you to answer that call by learning about these women and their stories, by learning about the loss that they've left behind, and then by moving forward with action that makes sure that Black Americans never again have to worry about police brutality as a threat to our very existence and lives. Thank you to the Portland Lesbian Choir. Thank you for raising your voices in song and solidarity with Black Americans everywhere. Say her name. Say her name, say her name, say her name. She cannot be forgotten by us. Say her name, say her name, say her name, say her name. Say her name, say her name. Say her name, she cannot be forgotten by us. Say her name, say her name, say her name, say her name. Put her name in the air. Put her name in the air. Put her name. Milton, who? Ha. Say her name. Brianna Taylor, who? Ha. Say her name. Michelle Cousseau, Say her name. Rakia Boyd, Say her name. Latasha Walton. Say